Um, she, if you have not already met her, but many people here do know her, is an alum of our department from 2004, if that's correct. Yes, and I'm doing this without looking. Um, and then went on to Caltech to get her master's in aerospace and then a PhD in bioengineering with John Beery, and then went uh, to Embari, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Um, as a postdoc, and is now a research scientist. Oh, I'm going to check on that one, sorry. <laughs> uh, principal engineer, I knew I had that wrong. Um, and she's been working on underwater imaging, autonomous vehicle capabilities, and sensing, and studying of a lot of really cool underwater systems. Um, if, if you didn't already also know, I think I told some people, so she's here as part of the National Geographic Live Lecture Series, which is going on. Um, if you haven't already been, there's tonight, tomorrow night still, so you could see some more of her work there. Um, so part of our work is funded by National Geographic. It's also being funded by the Packard Foundation and the Gordon and Freddie Moore Foundation, NOAA, NSF, lots of um, engagement there. I was hoping we could really start talking to the screen, but oh, that would actually be part of it. Okay, all right. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, and you can. Yeah. All right. Uh, apologies, everyone. We're having some technical difficulties, um, and it's been several years since I came back to you. Dove. I think a couple years before I had come to. I'll let you do. Um, come to campus actually um, to have visit in the, the biology department of all places, and that's kind of a sign of where I've gone since leaving um, here. And, and more and more kind of multidisciplinary, not necessarily, is it working? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, not entirely focused on anything to do with our astro, but what I think is really interesting and what I'm hoping to convey, at least today, you know, there's this growing interest uh, in NASA, right, and the Ocean Worlds program, trying to figure out, um, you know, the kinds of instrumentation or tools that we need to find life um, in outer planets, and that's actually a program that we're um, doing currently in the oceans here. And um, if you'll notice the title of the talk is very different from my abstract, it's because I um, kind of had to rethink about how I wanted to present some of the work that we've been doing. I kind of want to take more of a broader step back about how do we do these kinds of observations and kind of where we're going to be going uh, in the near future. And I did still keep some of the PIV stuff in there, so. Um, first, I do want to thank a lot of different people. Um, the Bioinspiration Lab, which is my lab, uh, we have a few uh, kind of full-time members um, with backgrounds in applied physics, computer science, um, optical uh, engineering, and we also uh, work with a lot of different applied engineers um, as part of a number of different developments that we have ongoing within the laboratory and the these are uh, four key engineers that we work with all the time. And uh, I also like to thank my dog, <laughs> Karen Dog. And if you go to my talk, you, she's heavily portrayed. Um, but again, everything I'm going to show you today has required a lot of uh, collaboration, not only on the engineering development side, but also the, the research or science side. Uh, the idea or the intention of the lab is to really build up technologies for us to be able to understand you know, how animals function in their natural environment, and being able to do that in a, in vac in a vacuum is impossible. And so we work with a number of different people, um, uh, collaborators at Smithsonian, uh, you know, biologists, physicists, and it's been a lot of fun. Uh, but let me start with uh, this photo. Um, actually, this is a, a project that Bob Breidenthal was our mentor for. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> <laughs> but we were, uh, we had a team of students that um, put together a project, uh, was proposed and then later flown on the Vomit Comet as part of the NASA Reduced Gravity Undergraduate, I, I can't remember, it's some long acronym. Uh, but as part of the project, we were trying to um, understand Rowley-Taylor mixing in 
uh, microgravity or a, a different uh, acceleration profiles. And this was kind of my first jumping point um, for uh, fluid dynamics, uh, or at least experimental fluid dynamics. And while the project failed miserably, um, we forgot or neglected to actually calibrate the cameras we were using to observe the mixing phenomena we were trying to study. Uh, this was really my first opportunity to try and do what I consider field work, right? Going out into a very different location, trying to understand, you know, how something functions or how something works. And this has really started off um, kind of the next phase in my research interests. Um, thanks to a number of faculty here uh, at UW, uh, there are some recommendations to apply to some tiny technical school in California called Caltech. And before speaking with those faculty, I had never even heard of that institution. And fortunately, I took their advice, applied to graduate school there, and went off um, to complete my PhD, starting the aeronautics program, and then went off into the bioengineering program, which is what Christy said. But short story, the idea is if um, basically, instead of searching for life in outer planets, um, I wanted to start looking at life much closer to home. And so this is a fun transition video because what you're seeing is not actually a star field. This is what the ocean looks like uh, at 400 meters deep within Monterey Bay. And the oceans, un unlike, you know, our so far unsuccessful um, search for life in outer planets, you know, the oceans are teeming with life. And I've learned over time that we know extremely little about them. And so that's part of the reason why I do what I do now. I'm going to turn the lights off. Scene three. Okay. Sorry, because there's a lot of things in here I want to show you. Um, so now I'm, I actually did two postdocs, or two and a half. I, um, after doing a PhD at Caltech in bioengineering, focused on how small animals like jellyfish might swim and mix the ocean. I realized at that point I knew absolutely nothing about the ocean and then um, wanted to learn more. And I wound up doing a postdoc at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which is in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and then followed that up with a stint at the Hopkins Marine Station, uh, which is Stanford's uh, Marine uh, Science Institute. And then shortly after that, wound up at this really tiny research institution called um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. I think a lot of you here have probably heard about the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, they're based in uh, Pacific Grove, the, uh, the southern point there near Monterey. Um, but Ambari, the research institution, is a completely separate institution. It was actually founded by the same group of people, uh, the Packard family of the Hewlett Packard fame. And it was uh, established uh, kind of as an experiment this idea that if you have both scientists and engineers working side by side together, you might be able to affect significant change or significant developments um, that will enable us to study this really difficult to access place. And so where we are located, um, you could see that's San Francisco. I think that's where the dot is, maybe that's Palo Alto. And then if you drive south about an hour and a half, uh, you'll reach Monterey Bay and north of, um, no north of where we are, you can see that dot there, the A, that's Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, that's based in Moss Landing. Um, and the reason why we're there, as you can see in that bathymetry map, um, you can see we're very close, or at least at the entrance, to this deep submarine canyon. Um, the submarine canyon can get up to just under 4,000 meters deep, um, but what this means is within less than an hour of being on a research vessel, will be at water depths of about 1,000 meters. Um, and if you know anything about oceans and continental shelves, it's kind of a big deal um, being able to get to deep water very quickly. Um, and again, what really kind of struck me when I came to Umbari was, was their mission, um, and was to achieve and maintain a position as a world center for advanced research and education. Uh, and to do so through the development of better instruments, systems, and methods for scientific research. And so it's a really small institution, about 200 plus of us, but only, I think, 12 or 13 um, principal investigators. I'm one of them. Um, but that 
that research or that science side is actually balanced by 40 to 50 engineers, applied engineers, either with mechanical, electrical, or software engineering experience. And so we all work together to essentially address this mission. And I'm sorry, I normally walk around more, but I'm trying to save my voice. So <laughs> we're on the microphone. Uh, and I want to talk about midwater exploration, or at least the problem with midwater exploration. And this is something that, um, you know, not just the ocean, not just the science community as a whole, but, you know, the oceanographic community especially has largely ignored. And I like to put this up, up here, and you know, as the Euro Aero Astro world, we've, we've seen something like this, where you know we've mapped at least to this kind of high resolution, maybe 200 or 300 meter resolution, you know, the entire surface of the moon, the entire surface of the Mars, but we are very poorly sampling the bottom of the Earth's ocean. And that at that resolution, or similar resolutions, we're looking at still around 5% of um, areas that we've mapped. And then the numbers get horrendous when you start to think about the ocean as a volume, right? It's one thing to say something about the ocean at the bottom, but the fact that it's a, it's a volume, it's actually comprises about 93% of the habitable space on this planet. We have maybe observed about 1% of that. Anyways, it's a bit of a bummer. And so I want to kind of make this point about why should we be studying these areas. Um, I think that there's this idea or the sense that there aren't a lot of animals there, or there's not a lot going on, but there's actually something really interesting um, that happens every single day. And I don't know if you've ever seen something like this, but this is an, an, echo, an echogram. So think of a fish finder that might be on your boat. Um, in this case, this is a, a fish finder that we have uh, in the Monterey Canyon. It's actually connected to our I think it's called the Monterey Accelerated Research System. We call it the Mars node. Um, but basically, you can plug in instruments into that node and then power everything or get communications. And so we have this uh, upward-facing echo sounder. Um, and so what's, what you're seeing on the x-axis is time, and then the y-axis is depth. And then the color here, like the bright colors, are indicating you know sound scatters. Actually, so I can get a sense of who's in the room. How many Aero Astro people do we have here? How many oceans people do I have here? How many biology people do I have here? Okay, good. So I'm not gonna. I will. I will go at this pace. Um, so what you're seeing uh, at the warm colors are essentially going up and down, and they're actually timed. So during the day, that you know those that the dark. Sorry, the bright colors are at depth. Um, and you could see it the first day, uh, during the daytime, it's roughly around 300 meters. And then that uh, heat map moves upwards at night. And this is actually a, a ubiquitous picture. You could do this anywhere where there might be, you know, a bottom depth greater than 500 meters, and you would probably see this somewhere in the ocean. And what it is, it's actually what we call the deep scattering layer. There are actually animals that are doing these vertical migrations almost every single day. Now, if you do it by biomass and size, this is actually the largest by biomass migration that happens on our planet every day that we don't know very much about. And it's because we can't really observe these animals. Um, what else did I want to say about it? Oh, during the, the Natural Life uh, talk, there's a fun little statistic. So like if you were to scale this migration to the size of a human being, um, it's like uh, running a 10K before dinner a 10K before, uh, after dinner, before you go to bed, and then doing it at twice the speed of an Olympic marathon runner and doing it again the next day. So incredibly important, like it's a population thing. It's not just individual animals or individual like species of animals. It's like whole communities are doing these um, vertical migrations. The other thing too is that oceans midwaters are actually incredibly diverse and these animals have evolved in a number of different ways and a number of different things that they're optimized to do. Um, you know, you can imagine this is a dark environment, it's deep and it's cold and some animals seem to do better than others, but I just like to put this slide up here so you can see kind of the diversity of life that we do encounter. A lot of it is gelatinous, interestingly, and when we think about how we sample the oceans and how we've historically been sampling it, we've done a really terrible job of 
of observing gelatinous animals. So I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, and then the other thing too, you know, the ocean's midwaters are the connection points, right, that between the sea surface and the bottom. And the ocean midwaters, and as well as the animals there, play a really important role in processing atmospheric carbon and getting that carbon down to the sea bottom, right? Play an important role in sequestration of carbon, and this is important to you know the, the, the climate on our planet. And animals, and I'll talk a little bit more about them, they create these structures or they process food within the midwaters, and because of this interaction, they're able to rapidly sink carbon in, in ways that would otherwise take months um, to weeks. And so really important roles that all these animals are playing and all of these activities are happening in the ocean's midwaters. So I'm gonna start with at least how we study life in ocean's midwaters and um, talk I am giving tonight. I focus a little bit more on the history, but I wanna talk about what we actually do now. Um, when, if you think about trying to understand or study animals in midwaters, the, the thing about animals is that they have this unfortunate thing called behavior. Um, they don't like to just stay in one place. Um, and so what this uh, credit, or sorry, this animation shows, and I'll play it again, is that on the, um, on the right in black, that's the shore, um, the, the vectors there indicate you know, wind speed or, or flow direction of the sea surface. And then you'll notice that over time, this biological patch, you can think of it as like either population of animals, or you can also think of it as like roughly an individual. That patch or that position is changing over time. Sometimes affected by the physics, but also oftentimes not. And if we think about the ways in which we observe these biological patches, there's a number of different modes that we use in the oceanographic community. Um, the first is a fixed mode, and so what that means, right, is having a mooring at one location, and then hoping and praying that that biological feature, that patch, passes by. Um, so not really great, especially if you're trying to understand biological processes on like higher temporal scales. Then there's also the geographic approach, which we like to refer to as kind of the lawnmower approach, where you just run these grid patterns, um, where then occasionally you might run into these biological patches or, or these biological features. And then another, and I think this is something we're all more familiar with, at least on the ANA side, is uh, the physical um, applications, where perhaps we'll take a Lagrangian approach we might throw a float in the water and then have that float essentially move along with the, the ocean currents. Um, but again, the problem is, is if these animals have behavior, they're not doing precisely what the physics is telling them. And so one of the approaches that is really important, I think the whole community is moving towards, is being able to do things like on a biological scale. So what that requires is the ability to find these animals, target them, and then also track them in some way. Um, and then, so then, just kind of broadly, how do we study life in the ocean's midwaters? I'll start with um, trawls, because, you know, this is a technique that people have been using for generations, decades, and it's still shockingly widely used. Um, so what this is, right, is you just literally drag a giant net behind your ship, and then you, there's, all these different ways in which you can actually open or close nets. It can get more and more complicated, but more or less all you're doing is dragging a net, trying to collect whatever um, gets stuck. And then when you bring these animals up onto, um, or your net catches and you bring them up on the ship, um, this is what happens. You literally just dump the contents of the net into a collection container, and then researchers go through this really, really long, painful, I refuse to do it process of separating, collecting, separating, IDing, counting by hand what it is they're looking at. I, I don't know. I, I think of engineering, I don't think of us as lazy, but I think of us as like, there's got to be better ways to do things. And this is not something I recommend doing, but this is, this is what is done in oceanography. So if you want to know roughly what's in the water column, you drag a net behind it, never mind that there might be animals that will flee or avoid capture. And then you have this long, horrible process of processing the samples. Um, another way in which we're observing life in the ocean's midwaters are using remotely operated vehicles. And remotely operated vehicles are, um, I'm going to talk about remotely operated vehicles, and I want to make sure it's clear what the difference is between ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, and AUVs, autonomous underwater vehicles. 
sorry for people in the room who know this, but ROVs are actually um, vehicles that are attached to a research vessel via a long tether. So that tether has fiber optics, uh, multiple fiber optics uh, lines in it, and you know, through that you can get uh, communications, power, uh, a number of different uh, wavelengths. So if you have multiple cameras that you might be using or multiple instruments, you could all integrate that onto the vehicle itself. Um, so what you see on the left, that is the, the ROV dock rickets, uh, one, of the, one of the three ROV assets we have at Mbari. And um, that particular vehicle is about the size of a small van, not a small van, a large van, and it is rated to 4,000 meters. Um, and what you see on the right is actually what the control room looks like of an ROV. Um, at Mbari, these big ROV assets are um, dedicated to a research vessel. And so this is um, always uh, set up on the research vessel. And you can just see a whole room full of monitors um, you know, showing different uh, video feeds or diagnostic uh, data about the vehicles as well as the environment in which uh, people, uh, the vehicle is experiencing. But on the left, I want to point out there are two um, ROV operators or ROV pilots. And then sitting to the right of them are scientists or researchers or engineers. And so there's this common interplay or this common talking between uh, all the people in the control room to ensure that what we're able to do um, is successful because doing this kind of work on a research vessel can cost anywhere from twenty to $50,000 a day. So going to sea is not cheap. Um, the other amazing thing, though, about the re remotely operated vehicles, particularly at Ambari, is that we have this ability to sidestep this approach where, you know, if, you, um, you know, if you're collecting gelatinous animals in particular in nets, they're ripped up and destroyed by the time they're brought up to the surface. But we have ways in which we can very carefully collect animals like this one, bring it up to the surface, and actually do experiments with animals on the ship or at, at a lab. And so you can get specimens like these. Um, but the other amazing thing about being able to use remotely operated vehicles is that you can do in situ experimentation. And when I started in Bari about five years ago, I'd never heard about this group of animals. These are um, giant larvations. And giant larvations are basal chordates. So we're more closely related to them than we are to jellyfish. Um, but we, the animal you see there it looks like a tadpole. Its tail is, is um, pumping there. And then everything that you see around that animal, that's actually mucus that the animal excretes from cells lining the top of its head. And it creates this rudiment. We don't really understand how it does this, but we've observed it once blowing up this rudiment into a meter scale mucus house. I'm gonna play this again, because it's, again, a really just crazy. So this animal is about, they can be as large as 10 centimeters in length. That's giant for larvations. Most of them are about a centimeter to two centimeters in size, but these houses can be up to a meter across. We call them houses because uh, they live in them, so we're anthropomorphizing them, but uh, the function of that house, or at least we, we know so far, is that these animals um, use them as filters. So the animal is pumping its tail, driving flow inside of these mucus filters, and is separating particles from the water around them. And uh, when I started at Mbari, I was totally fascinated by this group of animals, and I had a bunch of questions right away. Right? How much water are these animals processing? What does that mean in terms of their ecology, right? How does that impact their environment? Um, what can we say about the structure, right? This is very complex. And, you know, as an engineer, you might be wondering, well, why make something so complex if you're just trying to filter water? I don't know. Open question. Still an open question. Um, and then also, you know, what is the actual shape of the structure? We, as in using white illumination, you're only getting this external view. We really have no sense of what's going on on the inside. What are all these chambers? Never mind how is this animal building it. Um, and so, fortunately for me, my background, um, you know, from an aero astro background and then focusing on biological fluid dynamics, I knew of a technique that worked really well with gelatinous organisms 
um, measuring fluid motion, and that's particle image velocimetry. Uh, how many here know what that is? A lot of you, great. Well, so particle image velocimetry works because we use a proxy like particles um, for the motion of fluid. And if you use you know, high-powered laser optics to generate a sheet of light, and you combine that with some imaging, you can then capture the motion of particles that are suspended in water. And so this is actually just an example of, of what a, a lab setup might be. Um, it's particularly difficult when you have animals that are involved because, again, trying to get them to do a repeatable behavior is, is impossible, especially in a tiny, tiny tank. Um, and so what, what you get, though, from this data is, is really you know, interesting and powerful, as a lot of you know. Um, so this is actually from a paper we published quite a while ago. And this is a, um, a crystal jellyfish, Aquaria victoria, swimming through a laser sheet inside of a tank. And what you'll notice really easily or quickly is that you know, the particle motion is really captured. Um, and then you can use this uh, data, this particle data, to come up with velocity fields, which you're seeing in the center. Every single one of those um, vectors or arrows indicates direction as well as speed of the local flow. And then once you have these velocity fields, you can do any number of things. I'm just showing on the right vorticity, right, the rotational sense of fluid. And very clearly from, from the vorticity, you can see you know, what the hydrodynamic wake structures will look like. And in this case, they're vortex rings that correspond to every um, relaxation and contraction phase of the swimming cycle. So really powerful technique. We wanted to employ this in C2, right? do this in the ocean. We've had a little bit of experience doing this in a scuba-based system, but I really wanted to push the um, kind of the boundaries in terms of what we thought was capable using these robotic systems. And so I uh, sat down with a number of um, Embari engineers who are familiar with these remote systems. And in 2014, we actually sketched out a conceptual design of what a system like this would look like. And um, in 20, I started my postdoc there in 2015, like in January of that year. And literally that summer, we had a first iteration of the instrument deployed on one of Mbari's ROV assets. Um, if you know anything about tech development, that is ridiculous. And um, we demonstrated that it worked very well. And in fact, the data I'm about to show you and some of the papers I'm going to reference was all published from the first uh, version of the DPIB instrument. Fast forward to 2016, uh, we've uh, basically repackaged the system so that it can be used on our larger ROV assets. That means now we can do measurements from the sea surface down to 4,000 meters, so wherever the vehicles can go. Um, and then now, in 2017, we've been able to de deploy the instrument on all three of Mbari's ROV assets. And so that's um, been really exciting because there's a number of other individuals or researchers who are interested in trying to do measurements of, of flow at these really tiny uh, temporal, or sorry, size scales, but also high resolution um, temporal scales. So this is what uh, the instrument looks like. This is version 3.0. We're on the fourth version right now, and we're actually hoping to um, freeze the design this year. And while well, it's already available to a lot of people, you just have to ask. Um, but so what you're seeing that is the front of Doc Ricketts, and then um, you can also see that there's this manipulator arm. Um, that manipulator arm has six degrees of freedom, which is great, especially if you're trying to do you know, fine-tuned positioning of any instrument that you might be using. And at the end of that manipulator arm uh, is the DPIV instrument. Um, for simplicity's sake, it's really just a camera and a laser and some optics. And all of this is remotely controllable, so depending on the flow environment or the research question, um, an operator on the ship can make um, real-time modifications to the system to try and you know, do a better job of capturing um, particle measurements. And um, what you're seeing on the left, this is actually version one. So you know, this is a more complicated version three where everything is packaged onto this nice manipulator arm. And for version one, we just wanted proof of concept. Could we even do these kinds of measurements in C2 on a remotely operated vehicle? And so what that involved was really deploying a laser housing with some optics, utilizing the science camera on the ROVs itself to see if we could capture particle motions. That was successful, which is why we're now on to version 4.0. 
the way this works, um, I feel like it needs to be darker in here. Does it, do you mind? So the way this works is, um, right, the, you have a research vessel at the surface and an ROV is affixed to the vehicle via this really long tether. I think we have about five kilometers worth of tether on the dock rickets. But one of the challenges is, you know, that the vehicle is experiencing a really different environment than, than the research vessel. And so the ROV pilots are constantly communicating with the ship's crew to ensure that the vehicle isn't literally pulled off of our objects of interest. And that happens a lot, especially mid-water. Um, and then what also happens is, as a researcher or a scientist, if you're really interested in a target in mid-water, you're having to communicate very clearly to the ROV pilots what it is you're hoping to see or trying to experiment with. And in our case, we were trying to put um, a one millimeter thick laser sheet on an animal that was two centimeters wide, that was anywhere from 200 and 400 meters deep, and then asking the ROV pilots to hold position for as long as possible so that we could capture the motion that you're about to see in the next slide. So it wasn't the smallest of asks, but fortunately we were successful and the ROV pilots are very happy to report that um, it was worth the, the time and effort. And so what you're about to see, this is actually raw footage collected from the version 1.0 of the instrument, right? <coughs> relying on the science camera for the mini ROV and then utilizing that laser housing that's just um, cantilevered off the front of the vehicle. Um, just to point out a couple things, because this is laser sheet elimination, right, we're getting basically a, an interior view of the animal, like a planar view of the animal, while it's inside of its mucus house. So the animal's head or the trunk is indicated there, and then its tail, and then everything that's around it is the inner filter, that mucus structure. And what you're seeing around it, all of those uh, shiny objects that are flickering, those are actually particles. All of that is suspended ambient particulate, so we haven't added anything to the field of view. And then as the animal starts pumping its tail, you can see particles are moving down along the tail chamber, and it's outside of, I think it's kind of out of plane, but then basically flow then wraps around oops, in these other chambers. Okay, sorry. <laughs> and then uh, we can actually use these measurements to directly, uh, so we use these particle visualizations to directly measure the filtration rates of these animals by focusing on the flow within the tail chambers. Um, and so actually read the paper because we had to do, uh, as you can imagine, a couple things, made a couple assumptions to try and quantify what, what these values were. And what we wanted to do then was to compare and contrast what our measurements or direct measurements were providing versus what other models or at least estimates um, from other researchers uh, at least predicted. And so um, Alice Aldridge and, and Mary Silver, uh, biologists in the field who study larvations for quite a period, long period of time, they estimated that these animals, or at least this sized uh, animal, would uh, filter about 10 liters of water per hour. And what we found using DPIV, the instrument, is that on average these animals are filtering about 40 liters per hour, and some of these individuals were filtering up to 80 liters per hour. Um, pretty significant for something that's about 10, less than 10 centimeters in size. And then um, what we can do, and if you have any questions about this data set, I'm more than happy to talk offline about it, um, but we have a 30-year uh, video transect data set that Bruce Robeson has been collecting, and it involves video transects with ROVs from the surface to 1,000 meters at 100 meter increments every month for the past 30 years. And then that video data is brought back to Mbari and is manually annotated by a group of experts and so we can do things like a search in the data, database to understand changes in population size over time. Uh, you can bin that data by month or by year, however you want to do that. But we can basically come up with you know, average or maximum uh, uh, densities of these animals. And then just for fun, you'll just take that 80 liters per hour number, scale it up to the population of animals in Monterey Bay, and you get some crazy numbers like these animals are filtering about 500 Olympic-sized swimming pools within an hour, or um, filtering their principal depth range in Monterey Bay in less than two weeks. Um, so pretty significant. Of course, we can have debates on whether or not that's really happening or is that really important, but 
Um, the fact is, is most of our sampling, uh, especially in the ocean, occurs at best, like on a monthly scale. So if there are booms and busts of populations, you know, if, if animals are removing particulate or food at these rates, if they are as high, perhaps we're also missing some dynamics about populations over time. Um, and so that was, so we published some of that work on larvations. The first paper was actually published in 2017. We have a series of papers that came out uh, about larvations, but now we're also partnering with benthic ecologists, so biologists that are studying processes that happen on the seafloor, and people are interested in understanding how, um, you know, how much fluid uh, sponges are processing, or how much, or how like animals like coral are able to feed in really dynamic environments when they can't actually move. And um, just to move forward, though, we've we've also had some success in deploying this instrument on other people's remotely operated vehicles. So we were just on the uh, Valcor, our, the research vessel Valcor, that's operated by the Schmidt Ocean Institute. And um, their, their ROV, I think, is rated to 6,000 meters, Sebastian. Um, and we demonstrated in November, I think it was November, or October, that everything works. And so this instrument will actually go to sea at, at, in December of this year in the South Pacific to try and be used to look at you know animals. Um, there's a fun mode in which we use DPIV. I'll show you later, and we'll be using it to do that kind of work. Um, we're also though teaming up with other people who are interested in understanding physical processes. So uh, researchers who might be mapping or doing ocean imaging on the bottom or trying to map vent fields, you know regions where there might be water bubbling up and, and, and trying to constrain those fluxes. And so we're using this instrument to try and do that. So because this instrument exists and we've been able to demonstrate that it works, um, we found over time that there's become more and more interest in trying to use that for different people's uh, research or science. Um, and so since our first deployments, um, so uh, we've had more than 100 deployments. Again, if you know anything about tech development, that's pretty crazy. And um, we're now on our fourth version of, of the instrument. But I want to say that we haven't stopped there. Um, you know, PIV is a planar technique, or at least the way in which we've designed or developed the instrument. Um, we're also now working on a planoptic system that enables volumetric visualizations so that we can do uh, in situ 3D reconstructions and volumetric imaging of particle fields in real time. Um, so what you're seeing here, it's a very similar development process where we start on a smaller ROV. Um, we're deploying at the, at the bottom there, you can see this giant housing, um, and then there's some lights here. And so that has the planoptic camera system. And um, this is, sorry, I got everything out of order. Um, this is what raw data looks like from, not raw data, so we process the data using um, we're using a camera system developed by Raytrix in Germany, and they have an entire a suite of software tools that allow us to do these 3D reconstructions. This is a Solmisis jellyfish um, that's in the center, and then you'll notice that as the animal's swimming, um, particles are moving. I should say that the color bars here, the color is the depth map, right? So that's the distance from the camera. And, um, what you're now seeing on the left is actually what the instrument will look like when it's deployed on one of our bigger ROV assets. And you'll notice um, a lot of lights are going to be added to the system because illumination is incredibly important when you're trying to do these volumetric measurements. I should also say ROVs is kind of the, the midpoint. Uh, we're starting to do autonomous underwater vehicle stuff, which I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want to at least show this to a few people in the room. Um, what we're doing is, uh, instead of using a single camera solution, we're moving towards a seven camera solution. They're all synchronized. And part of the reason that we want to do this is, depending on the science needs or the science goals, we can change the optics to either provide you know, three pairs of stereo cameras at different field of view sizes. So if you want to understand particle size ranges or how you know, number or sizes of organisms might change, we can essentially cover that entire size range using this multi-camera system. Um, and so that is currently in development and we're expecting 
to be deploying it on our autonomous underwater vehicles. You can see the ones there on the right. Um, they look like torpedoes, they're not. Um, that will be deployed hopefully by the end of this year. So stay tuned for that. This is all supported actually by the Moore Foundation. Um, and then, sorry I got ahead of myself, but autonomous underwater vehicles is, is the next thing, right? Remotely operated vehicles are fantastic because it allows real-time you know, modification or real-time input to changing your experiments. What time is it? Um, but what we're trying to do is also take a hybrid approach. So this is a, a vehicle called the Mesobot. Um, it's, part of, it's a multi-institutional development between Woods Hole uh, and Bari, uh, Stanford, and University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. And what this vehicle is supposed to do, it's, it's, it's actually designed for only midwater work. Um, but what I'm really focused in on, what I've been contributing to primarily, is the, feed, the, the, the missions on the right. And what you're seeing on the right are missions where the vehicle tracks things autonomously. Um, so you could either track rising bubbles or sinking particulates to understand a constrained carbon flux, or you can also be tracking individual animals. And the reason, but in order for us to track individual animals, we have to take this hybrid approach, at least short term, where somebody pilots the vehicle to find a target of interest. We initiate tracking, and then once we've started tracking the, that object or target, we sever the physical connection between the vehicle and, um, and us. And what that looks like, um, this is actually the, a photo of the Mesobot that was being tested in our test tank facility in Obari in last summer. And I just want to point out, there are blue stereo cameras, um, those are the blue housings. There's a separate science camera that gives you know, really high resolution, beautiful imagery for the animals or objects you're trying to observe. But then we also have red and white illumination um, above and below the uh, lights. But then there's also a tether dropper. So what that means is you can, you can basically prescribe when you're separating the vehicle from, from the ship and then allow it to carry it on its merry way. And I'm gonna skip this because I don't have a lot of time but the max depth is 1,000 meters. Oop, max duration of 24 hours. And so we've been developing for the last three years these um, tracking algorithms. This is part of a um, you know, collaboration we've been working very closely with Steve Rock, who's at Stanford University. Um, so he's done a lot of work with vehicle control and coupling our imaging experience, we're using this um, in a number of different areas. So you're looking at mini ROV, and that's the vehicle that we developed all of these algorithms on. This is our tank, test tank facility in Ambari. It's uh, 10 meters deep. Um, and you'll notice that we were tracking in an automated fashion, despite being tethered, it was fully automated tracking that target, that white PVC pipe. But when we track things in C2, that is not an easy thing to do. Um, but I wanted to show you an example of some of the data that we've been able to collect so far. Um, so on the left, at the bottom, you'll see that's actually uh, an animal we call, gosh, why can't I remember its name right now? Fronima. Fronima, thank you. Somebody knows. I said it last night. Um, but anyway, so Fronima lives or uh, inhabits a cylindrical barrel or a salp. And what we're doing is, this is the left and right camera up top. And what we've done is we've changed the illumination from white light illumination to red light illumination. And what you're seeing on the bottom plot is actually the orientation of the animal in 3D space. Um, and so um, what you'll notice is that over a period of time, once we've made this transition to red light, uh, it appears that the animal is, is swimming upwards at quite a clip. And you can see that in the orientation plot is pretty consistent. And so then there's always these problems when you're dealing with biology. It's like, how do you observe it without impacting its behavior? And so there's a lot of thought that went into developing the mesobot. How do you do that? Minimizing hydrodynamic disturbances. How do you select illumination so that it doesn't impact behavior? This is part of the reason why we're relying heavily on red or um, higher wavelength illumination. But I also want to show you an example. So that works really well. We've actually been able to track an animal, a siphonophore, for more than five hours autonomously. Um, as far as we know, that sets a world record. People can tell me, can tell me if I'm wrong, but 
Um, what we've also been able to do is prove situations or circumstances where our tracking algorithms fail. And so what we're doing here is the blue indicates uh, south that we are tracking, and um, in sweeps in a squid, and then that squid bumps into the salp, and then you'll notice the blue is then transferred to the, sal uh, the squid, and um, also the vehicle is actually bouncing along with the squid as it's um, thinning. And then shortly later, then we have this really messy field, right? The ocean is messy. And how do we then very smartly distinguish between uh, individuals or different features uh, to ensure that we're robustly tracking the thing that we want to track? Because again, going to sea is thirty to $50,000 a day. The last thing you want to do is to lose the animal you're trying to study within the first 15, 20 minutes or an hour. Um, another challenge uh, is the fact that you know, animals change behavior, but they also change their state. So this is a giant larvation inside of its mucus house, and we've kind of disrupted the field enough so that we've um, scared it out of its house. But we know that these animals will leave their houses. Um, we're not sure at what, what rate they'll do this. Um, estimates are maybe they'll escape their house and build a new one on a daily cycle but we don't know the answer to that because we haven't been able to observe them for any longer than a, a couple minutes. And so this is what we're hoping to do is at least with the mesobot or some version of that tracking system, be able to follow this animal for a long period of time. But how do you do that it, you know, using you know, simple computer vision algorithms if your visual target looks like this? And so this is where, um, where we're turning actually to machine learning and what we're trying to do is improve access by essentially severing the connection to our assets underwater. And um, the ways in which we're doing that is turning to supervised machine learning. And Barry, remember I said something about the 30-year data set that um, uh, one of our senior scientists has amassed. Um, that data set is in addition to the fact that all of our ROV footage has been manually annotated and expertly curated. Um, and so what we're doing now is we're literally spinning up that data to generate a training set for anyone else to use um, to try and train um, learning, machine learning algorithms to distinguish between different features. We've already had a lot of success demonstrating that from like a morphological level, but what we're hoping to do is that the training set will become a, a, a valuable resource down to the genus level so that we can distinguish between different kinds of animals. And we've already had some success applying this to our tracking algorithms. In fact, we deployed them for the first time last November. Um, but this is just an example. If you run the machine learning algorithms on the footage we've already collected, yellow indicates the mucus house and green indicates the animal. And so we were able to demonstrate using machine learning um, continuous tracking of a giant larvation as it's left its house. The added bonus is we've also been able to demonstrate um, searching and automating the acquisition of a visual target we were looking for. And so what we're hoping to do in March is combine all of that to go out, find a larvation without any human inter intervention, have the tracking algorithms lock onto a larvation, and then observe and track it for as long as we can. And this is all being done uh, with our remotely operated vehicles. And so where we're going, right, remember that terrible use case of collecting animals in nets and then collecting them and counting them. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to just avoid all of that. And the idea then is to run these algorithms alongside um, these AUVs to either, you know, through supervised machine learning, identifying objects that are in, in the imagery, or at least informing when there's objects we haven't seen before. So that's um, what I'm really excited about, and I think where we're gonna be going with this um, in the very, very near future. Um, but again, part of the reason why I got into this mess to begin with is because um, a lot of my research is focused on bio-inspiration or bio-inspired design. I do a lot of work studying animals to try and understand how they function. And what I love about the Midwater is it's, you know, the biggest habitable habitat on our planet. Don't know a lot of animals. If we could observe them, perhaps we could learn something from them. And so we're really in the tool building phase to try and get there. But one of the fun findings we had, at least with the DPIV instrument, was that if we used it in scanning mode, we could essentially treat it like a CT or an MRI scanner 
especially for animals that were either gelatinous or, or mucus structures. And so this um, paper has actually been accepted in nature. So stay tuned. Um, but you can get three-dimensional reconstructions of not only the exterior views of these mucus structures, but then also the interior ones. I'm going to let this sink in. Um, because if you think about it, you know, how is this tiny animal with only a tail and a head that has cells that secrete mucus, how is it possibly able to build such a complex structure? What is the need for all that complexity? I have no answer for that. Um, we're just really scratching the surface at what we're able to um, um, observe thanks to these developments. But before I end, I do want to end with just a, a summary of some of the opportunities, um, either at, in my lab or at Ambari in general. Uh, we have a really competitive summer undergraduate research program, so you can apply. I think the deadline is February 22nd for this summer. Um, but basically, you can select a PI or an engineering group. They actually have some example projects online um, and try to be there an entire summer. It's, it's paid, fully supported. And really, it's a, it's a great, great experience because it's for the um, interns, not for the PIs. Um, we also have a postdoc fellow program that's an annual call. We did just close it for this year, but it will reopen again next year. And then we've started a collaborative group. Um, it's called the Deep Ocean Inspiration Group, DOIG for short. It's a terrible acronym, um, but the idea is that we can provide at sea collaborative research opportunities for people who are interested in kind of the, the boundaries between organisms and their, their environment. Um, so with that, I will uh, leave a bunch of my sponsors and stuff up here and take any questions. Yes? How do you know that the red light is not affecting these animals? What light do you so I'll tell you what we're actually doing to try and answer this question. Because I'm pretty sure that you're not really attacking them. Um, <laughs> this is like a philosophical discussion, but I, I, I agree. So what we've, at least the approach we've taken so far, is we've just tried to minimize disruption, but we haven't been able to really quantify behavioral response. So what we've done, this is a project we just started this year. Uh, a couple of engineers in Ambari are developing a hyperspectral hyper light source and we're deploying that with a drop camera system. And then we're doing simultaneous measurements from a small ship, acoustics measurements, so that we can observe at least from far at population level, are they responding or changing behavior depending on the kind of light we're using. So that is our approach to try and actually really answer this question to quantify behavioral response to light. There's a lot of useful things that come out of that, never mind designing or developing a new underwater vehicle or imaging systems, but like in terms of fisheries, like if there are certain animals that are attracted to different light um, or animals that try to avoid that light, could you perhaps develop better fishing systems to select different kinds of animals you might be searching for? So there's a lot of different, it's, it's great science, but it also has great application and it's kind of fun to be right there in the center. But are you sure you're not affecting the whole group? We'll find out. Hopefully in two years, I'll have some answers for you. Following up from that, yeah. do any of these animals which live most of the time in the deep dark, do they have photoreceptor cells on them anywhere on their bodies? A lot of them do. And a lot of them, there was a paper I think published in Science, I want to say last year or maybe in 2018, where they were noticing that um, deep sea fishes are have very um, are very sensitive to green and blue wavelengths, um, and then I don't know very much about the literature, but there's always debates too because there are still some animals that um, can detect red light. There's some animals that bioluminesce either yellow or red light, but if if a lot of other animals have lost the ability to see that, um, so then you ask the question, well, what's what's the point? Are you how are you then, why are you doing it? Are you communicating to other individuals in the same species? Or, anyways, a lot of fun, interesting questions around that. I, your hand was up earlier. Uh, you're talking about the MRI and like that last image of going through it. About eight years ago, a family member had open heart surgery. We got to see echocardiograms. 
and MRIs. We're being shown all these things bouncing around. We're going, huh? <laughs> Has it improved? Because that was definitely a lot better than the MRI, you know, the cardiac MRI. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, the, so the models, the model I just showed you, it's a little unfair. It's actually not the model that we've wound up getting published. Um, we've, uh, we've moved a little bit more on the algorithms, improved them uh, quite a bit, and so we have a lot more detail. We've also done a lot more reconstructions since that, that, that time. Um, but at least in the instrumentation side of things, we're pretty limited to what we can do. Um, I think, uh, for us at least, the, the millimeter thick laser sheet is probably a hard limit on how thin we can make make it, at least in C2. Um, but, you know, part of what I do and what I've focused on is like taking technologies that we're used to using in the laboratory environment and trying to repackage them and apply them in C2. So perhaps there's something out there that will make sense to apply later, but um, this is where we are at least now. Any indication that there are any Stokes number effects associated with this mucus uh, pumping and filtering? Ooh, good question. I mean, what what's interesting, at least if you compare these different organisms. So, like giant larvations are quite they're giant. They're you know about ten centimeters ten centimeters in scale. The other animals. Um, like the oikoplura, they're about a centimeter in scale. And the dynamics of their tail is completely different. The smaller animals, they look more like a peristaltic pump. So, right, obviously, um, the, the, way the, the way its tail basically moves, it's pushing water and, and containing water between the upper and bottom portions of the chamber. Whereas what you saw here with the giant larvations, the tail is not constraining or constricting the upper and bottom surfaces. So obviously a very different Reynolds number regime. But in terms of, I think, your question, hmm, I haven't really thought about it. But what, what, is, what, what, I, what I was hoping to see, though, was that the mucus houses, at least with the structure, was maybe playing some passive filtration role. Like, perhaps there are these features or structures that you know, in certain locations of a house, you might see larger, smaller, smaller particles constrained. But we've done particle, uh, we've done particle injections uh, from like 15 to 600 micron diameter size particles, and they eat all of them, and all of those particles wind up in their mouths. Maybe it was just a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. But that, uh, anyway, lar larvations we could spend forever and ever like asking questions about them. But you know, they're one of many animals to look at. Um, there's a hand back here. You yes. Um, I was wondering in your imaging the difference between the jellyfish and the <coughs> sorry, what's the one called? Larvation? The, yes, the larvation. Uh huh. I was wondering why the larvation was essentially transparent to the light, but the jellyfish was was that like a post processing thing or it has a lot a, yeah, it has a lot to do with the opacity of the tissues. Um, and in fact, some jellies, when we do you know work, they're very opaque, or they might have really bright pigment. Um, the laser does not go all the way through um, their bodies. Okay, and so then on that, how did you get the vectors on top of the fish? Was it completely transparent? So that is because it's an artifact. It's basically picking up the motion of the entire body itself. So normally when you do PIV, what you should be doing, and I didn't do it in 2011, was to mask out the presence of the body so that you're only capturing the motion of the particles around it. Good eye. Um, over here. Uh, so you said that your autonomous vehicles have a time of 24 hours? The yeah. Yeah, so I mean, after 24 hours, you have to go find it, push it out, or like yeah. it back to the boat or something? Yeah, it'll come to the surface. <laughs> Designed to come to the surface. So to be fair, we're, the vehicle is still in development. We haven't deployed it for 24 hours yet. We've been kind of baby steps. Let's prove that we can do tracking. Let's prove we can sever the connection and still track something. Um, but yeah, the idea is once it reaches the end of the mission, I mean, there's a lot of onboard power um, you know, and safeguards built in, but basically the vehicle comes to the surface, uh, pings, we get either GPS or whatever other 
comms we want, and then we can go out and find the vehicle. So, but I'm trying, I want us to move away from having to use really expensive vehicles to do exploration. I think the oceanographic community could t learn a lot from um, CubeSat community and, you know, approach exploration in a much more democratized way. But this is part of the reason why I'm really excited about that training set, that FathomNet, I didn't even say the name of the project, the FathomNet project, um, because if we can get that data up and going, and really we're the only institution that has that quality of curation um, and, and data, uh, once we get that going, I'm hoping a lot of other people will jump in on the problem. So, stay tuned. Yes? On your PRD device, how close the animal is to be to the cameras and the laser? What is the limitation? Right, right. So right now, the PIB system, the laser sheet is approximately 22 inches in front of the front port of the camera. Yeah. And the, the design requirements were that we could observe uh, targets from a centimeter up to 20 centimeters in size. And we're going to have to just do one more question because Connie needs to get to And I want to take a photo of some of the faculty. <laughs> I was amazed by how much particulate matter there is in the ocean. Uh, and apart from the fact that it causes noise in your uh, field, mm -hmm. what is this particulate matter? Is it organic? Is, it, is there a lot of it man-made or a lot of it is organic. Um, a lot of it is uh, dead phytoplankton raining down, um, but a lot of it isn't. Or it's like remnants of organ or organics, like detritus. Um, but then, you know, there's in some locations, like, uh, you know, you might have wind that will pick up larger sediments or whatever, and that will settle. But it is pretty amazing that there is enough suspended particulate to do this kind of work in midwater, but we can also do this very easily doing PIV um, near the benthos. So. All right, well, join me again. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah.